The Oklahoma Sooners drop a close one to the Kansas Jayhawks. We've got some transfer portal news as well. And where does Oklahoma rank in the AP Top 25 all time? We'll talk about that on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Sooners Nation? Welcome to the Locked On Sooners Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thank you for joining me. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. You can read my work covering the Oklahoma Sooners over at the Sooners Wire. And you can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Sooners and on Facebook, Locked On Sooners Podcast. And first off, we've got to talk about the Oklahoma Sooners' close loss yet again, uh, this time to the Kansas Jayhawks. On Saturday, they lost, had a one-point loss to the TC Horn Frogs, weren't able to bounce back against Kansas, falling 67-64. to And this was a game of runs. It had a lot of back-and-forth action to it. It was a very close game at halftime. Kansas led by just two going into the break, but after the the first break, or the only break, uh, the Oklahoma Sooners fell behind by as many as 12 points uh, with about 17 minutes left to play. And then over the span of five, six minutes or so, the Oklahoma Sooners then went on a 20-2 to two run to take a six-point lead uh, over the, the Jayhawks, and it looked like they were in control of this game, but Kansas being the tough, difficult team that they are, they battled back and over the final or between like the nine minute mark, the eight, nine minute mark of the game and the, you know, about one minute, 18 seconds left or two minutes left to play in the game. Uh, Oklahoma either led that game or tied were tied with the Kansas Jayhawks. And yet they weren't able to close it out. Kansas comes up with the big shot um, late in the uh, late in the game with about 11 seconds left. Uh, Christian Braun or Brown. They were pronouncing it Brown, but it, it reads like Braun um, on the broadcast. And he hits the three to put the, the Jayhawks up for good. Oklahoma is unable to answer. Uh, and yeah, just a disappointing loss in a game that they very well could have won. They got to the line more times in Kansas, but were only able to shoot 67%, uh, shot 12 of 18 from the free throw line. Their three point percentage was pretty poor. They shot 23 and a half percent. And, one of the things I feel like is, is happening right now is you've got some guys that really aren't three-point shooters that are taking a lot of threes, and they're just not converting them. When, when some of these guys like Elijah Harkless, they, when they get hot, yeah, man, just let it loose, swing it from downtown. But he's not really hitting. Tanner Groves isn't really hitting. And so it, it kind of falls on Emoja Gibson to be able to hit from downtown, and, and he was just two of five. But – I think what's what we're seeing is that when he's attacking the lane and really when this team attacks the rim, they're playing really good ball. It's when they're kind of settling for for outside shots, settling for the three that when that's when they kind of struggle. And you you don't fault them because when you're open, and there was a lot of times where they were they had really good open looks, they just weren't knocking them down. Uh, one thing that you do take away for, as a positive from this game is that they were able to cut their turnovers nearly in half uh, compared to the TCU game on Saturday. Against TCU, they had 20 turnovers this time against Kansas, arguably a much better team than the Horn Frogs. They only had 11. So they really did a, a, a nice job with ball security, ball control, uh, making sure that they weren't giving away possessions uh, to a really good Jayhawks team. Now, the, this is a team that's continuing to grow. They're continuing to get better as uh, Porter Mosier continues to just mesh this group of transfers and returning players and incoming freshmen. And so it's, it's one of those like, yes, they're, they're having some struggles now, but they're showing some, some, some really good things. So like you get down by 12 points to Kansas in the second half. You're like, man, that might as well be murder. She wrote like it is done. Angela Lansbury is going to come and, and investigate the crime. It's over. But these guys are showing a lot of heart, a lot of determination, and a lot of grit to be able to battle back and not just battle back and tie the game, but battle back and take a lead and then either lead or tie, be tied most of the rest of the way until just the final you know, 20 seconds of the game when Kansas finally takes the lead for, for good. And, and I think that does say something about your team that even if they're not really 
playing the best basketball, they're showing a lot of character. They're showing a lot of integrity, continuing to go out there and battle every single minute, every single possession, where it'd be really easy that when you get down by 12 points that you just kind of hang it up and just kind of, you know, walk away. But this is a team that's got a lot of determination. And I think that that's some of Porter Mosier, but that's also some of the mentality of some of the guys that are key players for this team, like an Elijah Harkless, like a Jordan Goldwire, like a Tanner Groves, guys that are, you know, for the most part would be considered like under, under the radar guys or underdogs, nobody that was like a highly, highly recruited or is considered a superstar, but they all come in with this chip on their shoulder. And as a collective, that chip kind of carries over into the games and they're able to battle through adversity. And that's what you really like to see from a team that may not be the best team in the big 12, but they're going to be a competitive team and they're going to make most every single game a dogfight with whatever team that they're playing. And they're going to win some of these games at some point, you know, these close, these close finishes that they've kind of lost to TCU and then now lost to Kansas. Those are going to come up in the Oklahoma Sooners favor at some point. Uh, Several guys had nice games. Uh, you know, Emoji Gibson had a really solid game today. Uh, Jordan Goldwire was the one that really led the way. He had 15 points on four of nine shooting, but he got to the line nine times. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Getting to the basket, attacking the rim, that leads to good things. He shot seven of nine from the free throw line. When you're not shooting great, and Oklahoma, you know, they had a decent night shooting. They were 42.9%, uh, 23.5 from from three-point range is not good, but it just goes to show you how good they were uh, from two. You know, when they were attacking the, the paint, attacking the line, uh, the, the rim, they're converting more often than not. And when they're not converting, they're getting to the free throw line. They had 12 more free throws than Kansas did. And that's not because Kansas was just sitting back, but, you know, the, the Sooners' rim defense was pretty good. But at the same time, Kansas was more than willing to settle for three-point shots. Um they hit them at a little bit better clip. They were eight of 17 while the Sooners were just four of 17. And so if you're Oklahoma, you want to go into kind of your game planning, your strategizing sessions thinking, we just need to continue to attack the basket because you've got players that can get to the rim. Emoji Gibson, he's a sneaky penetrator. You got a uh, Jordan Goldwire showed off tonight that he's got that speed to blow by guys. I think he, um, Bajan Cortez, sorry, excuse me. Bajan Cortez, he's very good. At, he's kind of in that um, Austin Reeves mold where you know he may not be the most athletic player or the, or the fastest player, but he's got the skills to be able to get by guys and get to the basket. You know, get Tanner Groves some easy buckets in the paint. I know that they really like him facilitating from the top of the key, but at some, to- at some point you want to post him up and let him use his skills uh, down low to get some easy buckets as opposed to having you know having him working so far away from the basket. He's very good in that role. He's a good passer, and so it helps, but you don't want to do that every single time he's on the floor. Kind of mix it up a little bit. You, use some pick and roll. They're using some of that tonight, but he wasn't able to really flash open and, and get opportunities for easy buckets as the flasher. But, uh, you know, it. you don't want to take have, like, moral victories. Like, moral victories aren't going to do you any good when it comes to term- tournament time. But the road that they're traveling through the Big 12 is a road that's going to help prepare them for the tournament. This is going to be a tough conference throughout the conference play throughout the Big 12 tournament. And if they're able to finish the season with 20 wins or so, I think that's going to be huge for them. It'll get them into the tournament. And then potentially they'll be able to make some noise because they'll be a battle-tested team having gone up against Kansas on Saturday, they get ready to play Baylor who is a tough team as well. Then they have West Virginia who is not going to be a slouch by any stretch of the imagination. And then after that, they get Auburn who's currently the number two team in the country. So for, for all the things that may not be going perfectly well right now, or may not be going well, like they're playing these close games against tough teams. They're still kind of learning what they look like as a team. And I think that's going to pay off come turn- tournament time when they get into March Madness. They're going to be a team that is able to overcome adversity and they're battle tested going up against some of the best in the country. Now you want to see them win some of these games, pull out some of these victories because it'll help just give them the confidence that they need to go in and make some noise in the Big 12 tournament, but also make some noise in March Madness as well. So other got to also shout out CJ Nolan had a really nice game off the bench. 
uh, led the Sooners with eight points off the bench in eight minutes. Uh, he was three or four shooting two or two from a three point range, which was really nice to see. You know, but John Cortez, he continues to have, I, I feel like, really solid games, a lot of solid minutes. Uh, played 18 minutes for the Oklahoma Sooners, had two assists uh, and just one turnover, uh, but does handle the ball quite a bit for Oklahoma. And then Emoji Gibson, 11 points, four of 10, shooting two of five from, um, from three point range. And then Jalen Hill, I feel like this has got to be a guy that's got to be an X factor for this team. You know, he had a 10.7 rebounds, um, an assist, and a steal. If they're able to continue to get that kind of a performance out of him on a nightly basis, they're going to be a really tough team to beat because similar to Jordan Goldwire, he's kind of an athletic guy that's able to get to the basket, and that's just going to help. You want to get as many easy buckets as you can. While basketball is evolving into a three-point shooting game, if you're not good at three-point shooting, then go to the rim. Use the guys that you've got that can get to the basket, penetrate, find easy looks. And I mean, Elijah Harkless did it on one play in particular tonight where um, it looked like he was going to go to the basket and drew the defender and just made a nice little kind of almost like a handoff to Tanner Gross, who was able to put it away for an easy layup. So more of that, that's what you want to see from this Oklahoma Sooners team moving forward is just attack, attack, attack the rim because I feel like they've got the ball handlers they're pretty good at penetrating and they have some guys that are really good finishers around the basket too. Overall, a, you know, a solid performance for, for the Sooners. They played well at times and spurts in this game. Um, they just got to learn how to finish games because they're a tough team and they have enough skill. It's just, they've not been able to close out each of the last two games against TCU and Kansas, but big test for them again, coming up on Saturday against Baylor you win that game and it kind of helps to erase some of the, the frustrations of the last couple of games. Emoji Gibson just said, you know, ride with us. We're, we're going to get better. We're going to improve. So we're going to trust that. We believe in Porter Mosier. Things are going to go well for the Oklahoma Sooners. Now it's just time to kind of see it all kind of come together um, where we're just now like two months away from March Madness. So the season will be over pretty quick as things do move in sports. Everything moves quickly coming up next. Uh, we're going to get into some transfer portal talk. The Oklahoma Sooners added three defensive backs through the portal. And then uh, we're going to talk about where does Oklahoma rank in the AP top 25 historically? Uh, the college football news kind of put together their rankings uh, look like one through 130 of, of how teams kind of ranked out in that. But first, I want to talk to you about Bet Online. Bet Online would like to wish you a happy new betting year. As we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond, Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. It's a new year and a new updated desktop and mobile device. To sign up today and receive your so sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code Locked On to get started. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and the easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports. That's bet online where the game starts. And thank you so much for making Locked On Sooners your number one listen each and every day. Your first listen. Thank you so much. Thanks for subscribing to the show on YouTube. Make sure you drop a comment in, in there. I'd love to know where you're listening from. We got Sooners fans listening from across the country. I've even seen people show up from a, on other sides of the world. So just drop a little pin in there. Let me know where you're listening from. Um, I lived overseas for a time and it's always just kind of cool to interact with, with people, Sooners fans who you like, I met Sooners fans in Ethiopia. So that was always a wild experience running into people over there. So transfer portal talk, the Oklahoma Sooners, they've been active in the transfer portal, not slowing down by any stretch of the imagination as we're still kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop on, uh, the former starting quarterback for the Oklahoma Sooners, Caleb Williams, the Oklahoma Sooners and Latrell McCutcheon entered the transfer portal cornerback. He was a freshman last year going into a sophomore year, entered the court, the transfer portal for the Sooners had a visit with USC uh, this past weekend, but the Oklahoma Sooners are not slowing down. They added CJ Colden out of Wyoming uh, freshman, Kenny Walker out of Louisville and then Trey Morrison of UNC um, also committed to the Sooners. Now this is a, a very fascinating group of, uh, defensive backs. It's a very experienced group of defensive backs, uh, but let's just talk about CJ Colden to start uh, from Wyoming. He, um, you know, only played three games as a freshman, but then started each game of the last two seasons. So COVID shortened the 2020 seasons for them, 
but started 20 all the all the games in 2021 so 19 total games over the last two seasons and in 2021 he led the wyoming cowboys with 902 snaps he had 67 tackles which was fourth on the team and four and a half tackles for loss uh according to pro football focus he was targeted uh 66 times and gave up a catch just 59.1 percent of the time um pretty solid you know like in the Mac, you, you do run into some interesting offenses at times and, and some pretty good offenses. Um, and so it, it'll be interesting to see kind of how he fits in. Uh, and then, you know, we talk about Kenai Walker or Kenny Walker. Um, he played five games for the Cardinals. Uh, he didn't play much on defense, just played 15 snaps on the defensive side of the football in his freshman year and just four coverage snaps. He was a three-star cornerback coming out of Georgia uh, back during his uh, recruiting period. Um so he's kind of more of a project. He's a guy that's got some pretty good size. Uh, different places list him anywhere from 6'1 to 6'2. And, you know, he also ends up, at, you know, some, some people have him as something like uh, anywhere from 175 to 190 90 pounds or so. Um, and so it, a guy with some decent size, maybe he's a guy that could flip this to uh, safety for you because you're definitely going to have some safety snaps to fill in. Um, now, I would like to see these guys compete at cornerback just to give, you know, DJ Graham, Woody Washington some competition there. Um, and then we got to talk about the other guy, and that's Trey Morrison out of North Carolina. And he played a ton for the Tar Heels. Very experienced player. I'm trying to find his snaps. He played in four seasons. He played 44 games. So he's coming over as like a grad transfer. Um, and – Last this past or in 2020, he played all 12 games, had 39 total tackles. He was all ACC honorable mention. Um, just a really, really good player uh, for the Tar Heels that I think is going to be able to figure into the cornerback rotation for the Sooners. Um, they need a little bit of competition. I love Woody Washington and I love his what he brings to the table. And I think coming off of the injury, maybe things weren't super um consistent for him over the last you know half of the season but i think going into 2022 i think he's gonna be in a much better situation i think he's gonna play better he'll rebound out of this season dj graham he was a guy that i was looking to in 2021 to kind of be a breakout player for the sooners and it never really materialized he had some some good games at times but it wasn't consistent um you know and then we saw in the bowl game just how there were times where it just like he just allowed receivers to run by him um, uncontested without much press. And you're like, what are you doing here? And so I, I think bringing in competition for these guys, the, the incumbent starters is going to be a good thing just to allow the, whoever is the best player just to rise to the top. And it's something we talked about on last week's show that Brent Venables doesn't care who's here. He doesn't care who's committed. He doesn't care what they've got on the depth chart, what they've got, you know, in the transfer portal. He's just trying to collect as much talent as possible. That's why you see them out there. You know, they, they've got Dylan Gabriel. They have Nick Evers committed. They're still, they were still recruiting um, Chuba Purdy, still recruiting Jackson Dart. Like they're just trying to build the best team that they can top to bottom on the two deep. It doesn't matter who the starter is or not. And honestly, probably going into the situation to really create an open competition to let these guys battle it out because competition improves everybody. It makes everybody better because it raises everybody's game. I know that in sports that I played growing up, that if I was competing with somebody for another job, for a job, I was always like working extra on the side, working extra outside of practice, whether it was like on hitting or speed stuff or my fielding, I had to get better. If it was in lacrosse when I played in college, I was working, I was doing extra wall work to try and improve my skills so that I could get on the field more. I mean, or like at goalie, like there was only one year where I had actual competition at goalie and it raised my game. I was like out there more honed in, more focused because I did not want to let go, let a goal go by me or let bad goals go by me so that the next guy could come in and take my spot. I just wasn't happening. So competition helps to raise everybody's attention level and, um, and focus and raise their game as well. And so I like what they're doing. I like the cornerback uh, ads to the, 
the locker room because then you still got guys like Robert Spears Jennings coming in, Gentry Williams coming in, Jaden Rowe. Like a lot of it's the DB room is going to be really solid for the Oklahoma Sooners. And that's just in going into 2022. There's a lot of good things that are coming down the road in 2023 as well. But coming up next, let's talk about where the Oklahoma Sooners stand in the AP's top 25, like historical rankings uh, produced by College Football News. This was one that was was really fun. About, I wrote about it over on Sooners Wire, but um, but definitely check out the the actual article over on College Football News as well. But before we do that, let me talk to you about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. I love it. My wife loves it. We eat it on a regular basis. Just had the caramel macchiato bar tonight, and it was fantastic. It tasted so good. I love coffee. I love a caramel macchiato with just a little bit of sugar. Uh, but this this protein bar just hit all the right notes for me. I had a little bit of that coffee flavor, a little bit of that caramel flavor, and it was just so good. And the great part of it is it's good for you. And I highly recommend it. My wife highly recommends it. Make sure you go to builtbar.com. Sorry, built.com. Use promo code LOCK15. It's the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. It's great for you, and it tastes great. Anywhere from 130 to 180 calories, four or five grams of sugar, four or five grams of net carbs, and up to 17, 18 grams of protein. You cannot go wrong with that carb to protein ratio. It's fantastic. Go to builtbar.com. Sorry, built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15. Get 15% off your next order over at built.com. All right, now the Oklahoma Sooners in the AP top 25 historical rankings. So, College Football News, they basically went through the Associated Press poll and over the 86 years and handed out points to the teams based on where they finished the season in the AP top 25. So if you finish number one, you got 25 points. Number two, you got 24. Number three, you got 23 and so on and so forth. You finish 25th, you got one point. Now there's a bit of a, you know, it's not a perfect scoring system because it doesn't, it doesn't give enough weight to, um, to national championship teams. So like, you know, Oklahoma who might have finished second a little bit, you know, quite a few times, they, they were still getting 24 points while the number one team was just getting one more point than they were. I think winning a national championship should definitely carry a little bit more weight. And so these, these rankings, while there is a bit of objectivity to them based on the AP top 25s, the AP top 25s themselves are subjective based on how voters view these teams. And then you also look back into like the 1930s, 40s, and 50s when you're probably – the AP voters probably aren't watching – uh, much of the other teams in the country, they're watching whatever they can get on the, the, the you know, whatever channels there were or listening to it on the radio. Um, they're, they're just wearing a lot of options for watching college football back then. And so there, is, there definitely is some flaw to some of this, this system, but Oklahoma stands out in that they were the number one team in college football news' AP rankings. Uh, so let's look at the top 10. Coming in at number 10 uh, with 686 points, you have the Tennessee Volunteers at number 9 with 702 points, the Penn State Nittany Lions at number 8, the Texas Longhorns, 797 points, number 7, the Nebraska Cornhuskers at 798, number 6, the USC Trojans. Now, there's a lot of teams here that are connected to Oklahoma, uh, Texas, Nebraska, USC, just interesting. 837 points. Then you have Michigan with 1,016 points. Uh, Notre Dame, 1,028. Ohio State, 1,019. Alabama, 1,129. And Oklahoma, 1,136. So what's interesting about this is, okay, so Oklahoma hasn't finished number one as often as, um, you know, maybe Alabama has. Or they haven't finished inside of the top you know, 25, actually they finished inside the top five more times than Alabama has. Um, Alabama has finished in the top five, 28 times, Oklahoma, 33 times. Um, they were inside the top 25, 61 times. So they, they only missed it 25 times. Whereas Alabama missed the top 25, 26 times. So uh, yes, Alabama, they got more national titles. I, if I have that right. Um, you know, Oklahoma's got the seven national championships, still waiting on the elusive eighth one. And then Alabama, they've, I mean, had five or six during uh, Nick Saban's run. 
and um sorry i'm just trying to look up where So, you know, Alabama obviously is one of the best teams in the history of college football. And while, you know, being a, a, lot, a Sooners podcast, we're going to we're going to definitely like promote the Oklahoma Sooners. I think what's important here is that Oklahoma is one of the best teams in the history of college football, one of the best programs in the college, in the history of college football. College football news called them the greatest team or greatest program in college football history. According to the AP and according to their scoring rankings, they're up there with the best programs in college football. Alabama may be the best right now uh, based on what they've done over the last 10 years or so. And they have a history of of success as well back in Bear Bryant's days. At the same time, you're having a hard time looking past Oklahoma in this because they, they had a run of success in three different eras. You look at, you know, the, the Benny Owens era, actually four different eras. You look at the Benny Owens era, the Bud Wilkinson, the Barry Switzer, Bob Stoops and a little bit of Lincoln Riley as well. And and they've had a lot of success over the last 86 years. And so, yes, maybe they don't have as many national championships, um, but they have a lot of top five finishes, a lot of top 25 finishes. I mean, they had runs where they went like eight or nine years in uh, with, um, went eight or nine years with, with a top five finish, just an absolutely incredible run for the Oklahoma Sooners. Okay. So the most national championships, this is according to NCAA.com. Um, they got Yale at 18. We're not going to count Yale because their last national championship was in 1927. This is, that was even before the AP poll came out. That was the AP poll came out in 1936. All right. So we got Alabama, they got 16 and all but three of those came after 1936. So we'll say they have 13. Uh, then you got Princeton. Again, they don't count because all their championships came before 1936. Uh, Notre Dame with 13. All but four of theirs came before ni- or after 1936. So they had nine national championships after 1936. Um, and then Michigan at nine. Southern Cal at nine. Um, again, Southern Cal had two of their national championships come before 36. Michigan had shoot all but two of their national championships, according to NCAA.com. Um, then you got Ohio state, which all of their national championships came after 1936 and Oklahoma was seven. Um, again, all of theirs after 1936. So, you know, it's, and then it's also somewhat dependent on, you know, where these, um, who, you know, who crowned the national championship. Um, so according to, you know, a Google search, the, the coaches with the most national championships uh, that's Nick Saban with six AP national championships, but one of those is at LSU. You got Bear Bryant with five. Um, and then yeah, it, yeah, it still wants to give me Yale, but anyway, Oklahoma is one of the greatest teams in college football history. We can qualify it however we want. Uh, Alabama is a really great team, really great program as well. Over the last decade, you, you can't argue that there's been a program better than Alabama. Uh, but over the history of the AP poll, Oklahoma has been as good or better than any college football program in the country. So shout out to the Oklahoma Sooners and the eras of coaches that have been just great. I mean, how, how lucky have we been? to get a Benny Owens, a Bud Wilkinson, a Barry Switzer, a Bob Stoops, a brief run to Lincoln Riley. And hopefully now Brent Venables is going to be able to carry on that tradition of success and get them back into national title contention. That's the goal. That's the hope. Oklahoma hasn't won a national title since 2000, uh, and they are overdue. 
the that's that's the best way to say it. They're just overdue for another national title, and hopefully, in the next few years, that realization will come to pass. And that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to Locked On Sooners, to watch it if you're watching on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Again, let me know where you're listening from or where you're subscribed from. Watch or let me know on Twitter what you think about the show. Make sure you share it with some friends. Uh, follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Sooners, and you can follow me on Twitter at John Nine Williams. And until tomorrow, I'm John Nine Williams, Boomer Sooner.